Praise team. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How we all doing tonight? How we all doing tonight? I want to hear some. Yeah, that's it. Remember, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to our Wednesday evening service where we get the opportunity, the blessing, the privilege to be part of God's plan. Amen? Amen. Amen. We get the chance to praise him. So as we praise the Lord, let's praise him with our whole heart. Let go. Forget about what you did before you got here. Forget what you got to do after you leave here and just focus on him. All on him because he's worthy of all of our attention. He is worthy of all the praise and the glory. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And then we get the opportunity to be priests, to be royal priests, to be able to intercede on behalf of the saints and and on others to be able to pray for people. And then we'll get a word from our Pastor John. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and open a prayer, and then, and then we'll get our praise on. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord Father, for bringing us here. Lord God, for the opportunity to come together in your name to praise you, Lord God, to praise you, to to. to to, have the pur to give us purpose where we can intercede on behalf of others, Lord God. We thank you for that today. Lord God, we thank you for being able to, to just be in your presence, for, for that, to have access to you, to have fellowship together in you, to praise you, and to hear your word as it comes forth today, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord God, and we just ask you right now, Lord Father, just have your way. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey guys. Yeah. 
I'd like to repeat that one part of the song, the second bridge. When the night holds on. There's someone here tonight needs to hear that again. When the night holds on. We rest assured that God doesn't let us go. He will never leave us or forsake us. Never. When the night Thank you, Lord. Lord Father, if we know, if we know you, if we claim to know you, this is one thing that we do know. That, Lord God, you are always there. Lord Father, if we know you, we know that you will always either pull us through or you will pull us out. Whatever you know will work, worst, work the best thing in me. Because you know exactly what I need better than I do. And, Lord God, that's why I say we just have your way, Lord God. Just have your way today. Lord Father, I also just want to pray for, uh, for, for comfort. Someone is going through something tonight, Lord God, and I just ask for you. One thing that I know about you, too, is that your word says you are the God of all comfort. Lord God, I ask that you love on that person, that you just love on that person, that you comfort them. And let them know how much they are loved. Let them know who they are in you. Let them know exactly how you feel about them, Lord God. That you have a love for us that surpasses all understanding. That is beyond what we can even imagine. That you have a peace waiting for us that surpasses all understanding. We just thank you, Lord God, for for how how you see us, what you want for us what you've done for us, and what you are doing in this very moment. Hallelujah. Lord God, we know that you are here. We know that you are here. Lord God, tonight I just ask that you open our hearts, that you open our minds, that you make us aware of your presence. 
Lord Father, that we experience your presence in every way. Through, through, through the praise, through the worship, through, through the prayer, Lord God, through the prayer time, and, and through your word, Lord God, that we experience you. That we just not, we do not just pray to you or read about you, but we truly, in every one of these things, experience you. Because that's what you want for us, Lord. That's what a relationship is. And we thank you for this, Lord. So, Lord, I just ask for your for your anointing, a fresh anointing in this place, Lord God, to touch every heart and mind and, and lay down their hearts what you would have them to pray or what you would want them to request or the words that you want them to speak to intercede, Lord God. And we also ask, Lord God, that, Lord Father, that you just open our eyes and our hearts and, and just show us what it is that you have for us tonight because when, when, when John gets up here to give the word, Lord God, that it, it's not from him, but from the spirit of his Father, and that you are speaking to us through him tonight, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we just thank you for our pastor. And we thank you for everything that is about to come forth tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we started the same lesson last week, so if you have your notes from last week, you'll be able to do that. If not, if I could get a couple volunteers to uh, pass these out, that would be awesome. And uh, were you volunteering or were you just raising your hand because you need one? Okay, there you go. All right, anybody else need one? Just raise your hand and we'll get these passed out. Okay, there we go. Oh, here we go. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. It is always helpful when you walk up on stage to actually have your uh, notes in your hand. There you go. There we go. Got them. No way. I'm giving you guys nothing. Just kidding. I'm going to bless you guys. All right. Here we go. Well, like I said, I'm really excited to get into this. And uh, we uh, get to the weird portion of Second Peter. And it's going to be a lot of fun to just dive through this and see what the Lord would speak to us on it. So... If you're new with us on Wednesday nights, uh, what we usually do is we, uh, of course, have a time of worship you just experience, and then, of course, have a time to pray for each other, to lift up each other's needs. That almost sounds scriptural. And then also to uh, dive into God's Word. And Now, Wednesday night's a Bible study, so if you have a question, a comment, or a thought, just raise your hand. We'll talk about it and uh, go from there. And... Uh, uh, Wednesday nights is a unique time because I don't have an agenda to say I've got to get through this. Like last week, I, I, I made that sound that way, so I wanted to apologize. That No, we want to take our time. So I don't want you to feel like we're passing over anything. Um, I just didn't get into the weird stuff too much last week, uh, mostly because uh, the main point of this isn't about the weird stuff. The main point about this is a warning to the false teachers. Uh, but I don't mind getting into the weird stuff because it's fun to get into. And uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and dive into that a little bit tonight as long as we don't lose the main point of the scripture so many people that do um, uh, 
um, studies on the unique parts of scripture have a tendency of diving into those and making the minor things the major things instead of leaving them as minor things that are just fun to look into. Um, so make sure not to uh, get lost in the details, but make sure to stick to the purpose of the scripture. And we'll, we'll dive into that tonight. So once again, uh, we're on 2 Peter. 2 Peter, let me do a basic introduction here. 2 Peter, once again, was written about two or three years after 1 Peter. And this was during the time of a great persecution. God was uh, doing some amazing things around there, but there was also this amazing, horrible persecution that was intensifying in the church. But 2 Peter doesn't focus on that. 2 Peter actually focuses on the internal problems that was happening in the church, especially dealing with false teachers who were causing people to doubt their faith and turn away from Christianity. So 2 Peter combats these heresies by denouncing the evil motives of these false teachers and also reaffirming Christian truths, like the authority of Scripture. And like we talked about that one week where we discussed that particular verse, uh, I think it's one of the best verses about the authority and author, author, uh, authorship of, those, uh, of the verses themselves. So I think that's a great uh, portion of 2 Peter. Also, we talked about how precious the faith was because remember the Gnostics at this time were trying to teach these you know second uh, uh, generation believers that their faith wasn't as precious as the apostles or their faith also wasn't as precious as theirs who these seek these teachers had the secret knowledge and stuff like that so they were trying to teach them that their faith wasn't precious and of course Peter combats that and says no no your faith is just as precious as the faith of the apostles. And the beautiful thing by him doing that is we now see generations later, generations upon generations later, we as Christians know that our faith is just as precious as the faith of the apostles. So that's some of the things that he did to combat. He also talked about the certainty uh, that we're going to be discussing in the few, uh, probably months, uh, we're going to be discussing the certainty of Christ's return and getting into some eschatology as well. So that'll be a fun time to dive through that as well. Now, once again, when we look at this letter, this is not just a uh, random letter that Peter wrote. This letter is kind of like his goodbye address. This is his way of saying goodbye to the churches, kind of giving some last warnings. Most likely, uh, you know, he, he knew that, or we, we know that he knew he was going to be going. So most likely he knew that this is probably going to be his last letter. So he really wanted to uh, emphasize, you know, some of these good doctrines to be passed down through the generations. Now, uh, the Bible Project uh, videos, um, if you've ever watched them, I really enjoy them because they give a really good broad odd picture of uh, the different books. So what we're going to do now is we're going to show a little bit of a video clip to show you what we have covered in great detail in 2 Peter just to catch you up so you have some good context to what we're going to be talking about tonight. So let's check out this video. The second letter of Peter. It's addressed to the same network of churches as Peter's first letter and it's likely written from the same location in Rome. Peter's become aware of the fact that he's going to die soon, and the evidence that we have from early tradition was that Peter was executed by the Roman authorities during the reign of Emperor Nero. And so this letter acts as Peter's farewell speech. He begins by offering a final challenge that Jesus' followers must be people who never stop growing. And then this is followed by two final warnings about a growing number of corrupt teachers who are leading Christians in these church communities astray. First, by their corrupt way of life, and second, by their distorted theology. Throughout the letter, Peter is countering accusations made by these teachers against himself and the other apostles. And Peter's goal is to restore confidence and order to these church communities. So Peter opens by reminding these churches that through Jesus, God has invited people to become a participant in his own divine nature. That is, to share in God's own eternal life and love, which is mind-blowing. And it requires a lifelong response. To receive this gift means a commitment to developing the same character traits that mark God's own divine nature. Peter lists here seven traits to strive for. And the final one encompasses and crowns all of the others, it's love, which according to Jesus means devoting oneself to the well-being of others, no matter their response or the cost. To love, according to Peter, is to share in God's own life. 
Peter then states the letter's purpose. It's going to act as a memorial of his teaching that can be passed on to later generations because he's not going to be around to give it much longer in person. So before he dies, he wants to address these objections and accusations being made by the teachers who distort Jesus' teaching and that of the apostles. So Peter first addresses an accusation repeated by the skeptics present and future. Namely, that he and the apostles just made up all of this stuff about Jesus being risen from the dead and king of the world. Jesus isn't really going to come back one day. So Peter offers his eyewitness testimony of the powerful moment of Jesus' transformation on the mountain. Remember the story in Mark chapter 9. The apostles saw Jesus exalted as king, and his resurrection means that he's alive as king and will return to rescue our world one day. And so the future return of Jesus to bring God's kingdom, this will fulfill what all the ancient scriptures have been pointing to all along. The words of the Old Testament prophets prophets. They're not fabricated fantasies. Rather, through these human words of scripture and through the human Jesus, God himself has spoken to us. Peter then moves on to address the threats raised by corrupt leaders in the church, and he focuses on more objections that they raise. So first, these teachers deny the idea of a final reckoning when God's going to hold all people accountable for their choices. And this denial is what conveniently allows the teachers to ignore Jesus' teaching about money and sex, because they're making tons of profit by teaching in the churches, not to mention the fact that they're sleeping around. But Peter reminds the readers that God can and will meet rebellion with his justice. So, uh, Pastor Matt, would you mind uh, walking around with the mic in? We're going to have uh, lots of stuff to read tonight. I'm really excited to get into it. Now, uh, this lesson, we've actually already covered this lesson. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to do kind of a quick overview of your outline. And uh, then we'll get, go ahead and dive into some of these portions a little bit deeper. Our verse that we're going to be covering in, into depth tonight is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And it says this, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the day of judgment. So if you look at number one, um, like I said, I'm not going to go into great depth into um, our points here because we kind of already covered all of them except for the third one. And uh, we're going to do that one tonight. So let me just do a quick recap of number one and number two. And we'll, we'll pause on number two and go into that a little bit more. But number one is where Peter brought up some past judgment. Number one, past judgment. See, Peter pointed out that God did not spare the angels when they sinned. So he, uh, once again, he brought up the fact that these teachers are saying, hey, there's going to be no final reckoning. These false teachers are trying to teach people, you can do whatever you want. You can make profit, you can sleep around, you can do whatever you want because you know, there's going to be no final reckoning. There's going to be no final judgment day, so you can go and do whatever you want. And Peter's like, no, look at the judgment in the old, you know, look at the, the, the old, uh, you know, judgments. We're going to actually cover that in the next few weeks, some of the different judgments that are addressed in this particular portion of Scripture. But one of the things he says is even the angels, they were judged. Even those uh, from, you know, uh, you know, from before were, were judged. And if God didn't spare the angels, do you really think God's going to spare these, you know, these, these people that are living in sin and doing these things? So uh, when he is referring here, he says that, uh, that God did not spare the angels. Um, he could be referring to two possibilities. Uh, I think one is uh, more likely than the other, but there is two possibilities. So one of the things I do is I don't like to be dogmatic and say this is what this means because as Christians, um, even, you know, and theologians, they don't necessarily agree on everything. And then in this particular portion, uh, some people would say, well, the people who he's talking about who are judged, of course, is Satan and the uh, uh, fallen angels, the ones who followed him in the original rebellion. We looked up last week, uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, talked about that a little bit. And, uh, but... When we know uh, proper hermeneutics, you look back and see what the person was originally trying to come across and to say. 
And in this particular portion, it's most likely that he is referring to Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse 1 through 4. And we see a little bit of reference with this as well in Jude chapter 6, or chapter 6, verse 6. And then we also see Revelations talk about this a little bit. So most likely the sin of the angels that is described here in Peter was the sin of the angels that happened in Genesis um, is a more than likely what Peter is referring to. So let me get into that here in a little bit, and we're going to dive into that to the depths of that a little bit. Now, I am not saying that what Peter is saying here is uh, actually what happened. But what I'm saying, this is what Peter is using as an illustration to say what is going to happen to these false teachers. Now, I truly believe that Peter believed that this event happened, uh, but I'm not necessarily saying that it happened in this way. But if you look at history and know these particular portions of scripture, uh, it's most likely what has recorded. So uh, some of you are looking at me very vague. So let's go ahead and take a moment and read some of these uh, portions now. Let's read Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 through 4 and whoever would like to read that raise your hand please one at a time okay great let's go Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 through 4 when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Okay, so uh, once again, in this particular portion of scripture, this has been looked into, tried to be explained away, tried to do all the things. And that's not, when you're, when you're trying to understand what the person is trying to get across, you don't try to morph it into your current belief system. You just try to understand what they're trying to get across. Peter was quoting from a well-known um, writing of his time. It was uh, the Book of Enoch. And this Book of Enoch is a second temple period um, piece of literature. Do I, have, by any stretch of the imagination, believe the, the Book of Enoch was actually written by Enoch? No. It talks about the life of Enoch. It is a second temple period uh, type of writing, uh, which is the time before Christ. But this was a very popular work during the time of Christ, and the apostles um, quoted from this. We know that the apostle, um, you know, Peter quoted from this, and also Jude quotes from this as well. And let's go ahead and look at uh, um, two verses to kind of give you the, some New Testament quotations from this uh, book as well. And we're going to dive into that a little bit deeper tonight than we did last week. So can I have one person read Jude 6? Okay, right up here. And I need one more person to volunteer to read 2 Peter, uh, verse 4 again, plus, uh, actually, I'm going to skip that part. Go ahead and do Jude 6, please. Because we already did that in depth last week. Actually, why don't you read uh, verses 5 through 7, please. Yeah, Jude, uh, verses 5 through 7. Oh, you're fine. It's a small book in the very back. Yeah, it's a real small one. Yeah, if you miss it, yeah, it's within a couple of the pages. No worries, we've all been there. So once again, you know, we, we look at this and try to look and see what they were saying, not that what we believe they're saying, you know, and say, well, I think it was this and I think it was that. Look and see what they're actually were trying to get across themselves. Whether what they're saying is true or not, because even Paul quoted, you know, from the uh, Greek uh, thoughts, you know, where the, hey, there's an unknown God. So he said that too and, uh, and did some other quotations. It's not like he was saying that that was true. In this particular portion, I think Peter does believe that the book of Enoch is true. Uh, but once again, that doesn't give it validity to say that it should be canon today. All right, let's go ahead and look at 5 through 7. 5 through 7. All right, if I've got this right. Mm -hmm. Though you already know all of this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their pro positions of authority but abandoned their pro 
proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with the everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Yep. So once again, Jude is stressing... Remember, go back to the point. The point of this is these false teachers were teaching that there's going to be no final judgment. So Peter is saying, hey, yes, there is going to be final judgment. God's punished the angels back in the day. He's going to punish these guys as well. And Jude is looking at this and saying, hey, God's going to punish. Because remember, he's dealing with the same type of problems that Peter was, was these false teachers in the churches. And he stresses that God's judgment was on the Egyptians. God's judgment was on these angels that went down and intermingled with these humans that God's judgment was on and he lists off these different judgments at the time of Noah's days and uh, says the same thing and actually is a quotation from the book of Enoch there from Jude and then we also see in Peter that he's dressing the same type of uh, same type of things so let me uh, we're going to dive into that a little bit more but once again let me summarize number one up first of all so that you have C on your list did I get you guys B Okay, uh, B, uh, the judgment of the false teachers is certain because of their wicked lives and evil, um, evil lies. And then C is following the heretical um, uh, to destruction, or they could turn to God for salvation. So once again, the whole point of this verse is not to dive into the strange uh, belief system of this first uh, century uh, Jew, but to dive into the reality that there is going to be a final reckoning. We will stand before God and be judged. And it could be a, a blessed thing for us Christians to re receive our reward. That's going to be a great judgment. Or it'll be the uh, uh, unpleasant place. So... <laughs> So, number two, any, any questions on that before we go on? That's the part of this, this verse. The point of this verse is there's going to be a final reckoning. God judged the angels. He used that as an illustration. Now, let's go into uh, these angels. So, number two, the angels who sinned. So, once again, this suggestion is that, uh, um, that these angels were punished. They were cast into chains of darkness and uh, all that type of thing. But who are these? Why does it seem like some angels are in the pit of darkness in, in this holding place until the end? And the revelation says uh, that in the end they're going to be released out of the pit and they're going to have all these uh, funky uh, demons going around and doing havoc on the world. Why are some in the pit and some are cruising around right now? We see that Jesus cast them out of people. We've seen that as well in our church. So it's like, you know, why are some cruising around and why are some in the pit right now? And uh, so we want to address that. So uh, we covered this in detail last week, so I don't want to labor this any further because I want to be able to get into this a little deeper. Uh, so let's go ahead and do an A on your list. The sons of God came to earth, cohabited with the women, I'm sorry, with women, and produced children who became the heroes and famous warriors in ancient times. Now, a lot of people will look at these verses in... Um, uh, in this uh, scripture and they'll say well they're in Genesis chapter 6 it could have been the the sons of God were the Sethites and could be that the uh, sons of men were the Canaanites and there were those sons and you know they 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 just intermingled then why would that cause giantism why would that cause genetic deformities? Now, it could be that there was like, the, maybe the Neanderthals were the, uh, the mark of Cain. That's why they had the big old brows. And, you know, maybe the, the uh, you know, the, we, you know, Homo sapiens were the sons of Seth. And, you know, when we intermingle, because they say you got some Neanderthal DNA in you, I knew it. And, uh, but, you know, but maybe that's what caused giantism and maybe that happened. And, but that's not what the scripture teaches. I mean, if we're going to accept the weirdness of Jesus walking out of a tomb after he's been crucified, we might as well accept all of what they're actually saying. And in this particular verse, that's not what they're saying. If you look at every place where the Old Testament refers to somebody as the sons of Elohim, which is not uh, you know, just sons of God, it really means the sons of El, which is God in the Canaan, uh, Canaanite language. And then Elohim, of course, is referring to in, in the first person of, our, of Yahweh, of God. And in that portion, we see that it is the sons of Elohim. And in that portion where it says sons of Elohim, it never refers to humans in the Old Testament in that light. Now, some people quote uh, Psalms 98 and says, well, it says that here in sons of Elohim. Well, it's not referring to them. 
It's referring to angels. Now, let me, let me demonstrate that for you. Let's have someone look up Job chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 2, verse 1. And 38. I got. Any volunteers for Job? It's a depressing book, but it gets better. All right, in the back. Let's have you look up Job. Uh, we'll have you pop around to a few little places. Uh, Job chapter 1, verse 6, please. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. How, how far do you want me to read? Uh, just verse 6, and then uh, go to chapter 2 real quick in verse 1. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan. You see where it says angels? They, they are interpreting that for you. If in the original text, it does not say angels. It says sons of Elohim. You can look that up. So, all right. Then if, let's go to chapter 38, verse 7. While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted, for joy. It says the Hebrew is the sons of God. Okay. Ah, it actually even says it there. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Exactly. And in the Old Testament, every place it says, uh, it's like, I think the actual term is Benahen Elohim. When it says the sons of God in that particular portion, it always is referring to angelic beings. It is never referring to throughout the entire scripture. So if we let scripture interpret scripture, we can see that we can't take Genesis 6 out of context because it seems weird to us. It's not the proper way of doing it. Now, I used to be a little bit more, well, it could be this or it could be this, and it could be. I don't think so. I don't think there's scriptural evidence of the Seth thing and, and you know, that type of thing. And that wasn't even taught until Augustine. You know, um, all the original uh, uh, first century Jews, they didn't believe that because they believed in the book of Enoch. They actually, you know, thought that it was, you know, true. All right. So um, I have some other ones in Psalms 29, verse 1, if you want to look it up. It talks about the sons of Elohim. Uh, uh, Psalms 89, Verse 6 will rock your theology, so make sure to ask me about that one, because that one's really cool, you know. Yeah, uh, 29 verse 1. Well, let's do, let's do the, can I, can I, hey, Ken, you remember that book I, you guys read on uh, Supernatural and the, uh, um, the Unseen Realm? Are you reading it again? Okay, well, let me, uh, let me mess with you guys a little bit tonight. Once again, this is not important. What is important is Peter telling the uh, uh, false teachers, there's going to be a final judgment. That's the heart of this verse. This is just for fun. Is that okay with you guys? Do not walk away with this with some funky theology. All right? All right, so let's just get into it and have some fun. And if you are online listening to this, don't be all weirdo about it. All right. Um, let's go ahead and look up Psalms 89, verse 6. We might have to read 5 and 7 and 8 too, though. Context is always a beautiful thing. Uh, yes, with the mic, please. Right over here. You can do it, buddy. Psalm 89, 6. For who in the heavens can, can be compared to the Lord? Who among the divine beings is like the Lord? Uh, let's go ahead and actually read verse 5 through eight, if my memory serves. I don't have this in my notes, but. The heavens angels praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the divine beings is like the Lord? A God greatly feared and reverently worshiped in the council of the holy angelic ones and awesome above all those who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. Yeah. Can I tell you in the Hebrew, it sounds even worse than what you just heard about the divine host. It actually is, uh, read that portion there in verse 6 one more time. And then 7 maybe. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the divine beings is like the Lord? 
We do not believe in multiple gods, but who are these divine beings? A God greatly feared and reverently worshipped in the council of the holy angelic ones. See where it says holy angelic ones? It doesn't say that in Hebrew. It says who 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 among um, uh, oh I'm going to butcher this. Who among Elohim can stand in the council of the Elohim's? You know, in a plural, it's not Elohim, so it's a different term. But uh, but it, it's it's referring to. Uh, referring to them as, as El or gods. But here's the thing that is an interesting thing. So it's saying that basically that Yahweh stands in the council, uh, or Elohim stands in the council of the other Elohim and, you know, makes things. So that would almost sound like we're polytheistic in that belief system. That's not what it's necessarily getting across there. But what it is talking about, and uh, some portions will tell you that this is talking about the human, and it's not. I mean, the context there is clearly angelic. And, uh, but let me, uh, let, me, let me hit on this, and then I'll get you guys. Uh, but when it refers to this, these are, these are angelic beings. This is what is called uh, in, in uh, modern um, theology the divine council. And it is not referring to multiple gods, but it is referring to those who have and bore the image, the, um, the Amado, Amago Dei, the image of God. And uh, that is those angels that it's referring to. And it's talking about the sons of Elohim. So let's go here and here because she did have her hand up first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they do exist, but they, they, they aren't like Yahweh. And we're going to hit on that. Side. Let me have hers and then I'll comment on that because that's a little bit more of a comment. Go ahead. Please do. Please do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you get the mic? Because we would do have people online as well. Yeah. Hebrews 1 uh, and 5. For, which, for to which of the angels did God ever say, ever say, yeah. you are my son? Yeah. But I will say this. In the different translations I've looked this up, every time it referred to angels as the sons of God, it was lowercase. Yeah. I did not look that up in the Greek to see why. But in this, it is uppercase for Jesus. Now, I'm going to put Matt on the spot because I know Matt has the explanation for the only begotten son. What does that mean? Put you on the spot there, Matt. The only begotten? I don't know. You put me on the spot. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> man. We're, we're, it, it refers to God as, uh, sorry, I thought you had that on your uh, back burner there. I'm my bad, dude. I wouldn't have done that if I didn't. Uh, sorry. But, uh, but basically when it's talking about the only begotten son, it is referring to the only one who comes from the father, that it's an equality thing. Because we know throughout scripture that they called the angels the son of God. I mean, it showed that and clearly, I mean, the context there, it says angelic beings. And it also refers to in Job, them, the sons of God and stuff like that. So it does refer to it uh, throughout uh, scripture like that but that particular verse he is referring to the one unique son of God he is the only one begotten of the father he is uh, he, well, he's God in the flesh yeah so in that particular place yeah he's not giving anybody equality besides himself and even in this verse you're right he doesn't give him equality even in this verse he stands in the council of the Elohim but those aren't Elohim as far as an equal or a son that is equal with father does that make sense? So it refers to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I agree. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I could look up that particular verse and uh, bring some uh, stuff back with me if you would like. Uh, but when it comes to referring to Christ, yeah, um, it, it, yeah, I mean, we know throughout Old Testament. So either scripture's wrong or they're thought, you know, of that particular verse is wrong. Yeah. 
Oh, no, I hear you. But, but throughout the Old Testament, we know for sure that they, that he did call the angels the, you know, uh, the sons of God. But it didn't refer to them as sons as an equal like he does refer to Christ. Christ, he doesn't refer to him as a created being. It refers to Christ as an equal with God because that's why he was crucified. He blasphemed God if he wasn't an equal with God. So when it comes to how Hebrews is looking at it, he's saying that who he is calling, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, he is referring to him as an equal. He is my begotten. He is my own. And to no angel has he ever done that. Completely. Yeah, I, and, and to that I completely agree. So going back to what you were referring to there, um, say it one more time if it refreshed my memory. I went off on a tangent there and I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. So what happens is, and if you look at this, it kind of seemed a little weird when I first say this, but um, you, can, you can see this yourself, and it's not weird theology. It is uh, standard. You can look this up for yourselves. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, but basically what happened was is through, uh, well, actually, we're going to hit on some of this in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus. We're going to hit on some of this. But basically what happened was is God dispersed, you know, um, humanity, and he gave us control and dominion over the physical. Well, it would make sense, too, in the spiritual that he would also do the same thing. And we do see that. We see the divine counsel there in Psalms 89. And we see that, you know, even Satan and Job went before, you know, or it could be Satan. It doesn't say that necessarily. It says the adversary that came and, and went there. So what happened was is these demons were spread out throughout the earth. Some of them were goat demons. We're going to discuss a little bit here if I don't keep talking. And, uh, but basically, these demons were spread out through the regions, and they did dwell in these areas. And what happened was people started worshiping them as gods. In Leviticus, in multiple places in the New Testament, it refers to them as demons and not gods. They are created beings. There is none like Elohim. There is no divine gods out there that were just lesser gods. But he is the only God. He is the only um, uh, non-contingent being. Everybody else was contingent upon their creation. So, yeah. So there is, in the technical sense, smaller case G gods. But they're just demons. We refer to them as demons. Yeah, so they, they don't have the power that, you know, uh, that, you know, that Yahweh has. So, all right, so let's fly through this next portion. Uh, once again, the B on your list, the Second Temple Jewish writings said um, that this was the basis for the human wickedness and led directly to the flood. And then C on your list, they were cast into hell. Now, I want to... Uh, kind of hit on number three later, I want to take this time to kind of address some of these things because I think it's important for us to know uh, what Peter was trying to address a little bit more. Let's have someone look up Jude 14 and 15. And I will show you some stuff and I'll read you a few things. So let's go ahead and uh, have someone look up Jude. 14 and 15. Great. Right here. Or here. It doesn't matter. Whoever's first. We got lots to read. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. All right. So we can see there he said that Enoch prophesied. Show me that in the canon. You can't because it's not there. So what he is referring to, once again, is the common during his time period, the second temple period writings of Enoch. Now, you can actually see this direct quotation from Enoch, Enoch chapter 1. I'm not um, proponing Enoch. I'm just going to get to that right now because I think that part of it is clearly forged, clearly wrong. So I'm not saying this should be canon by any stretch. I'm just telling you what the apostles were believing and teaching at the time. I'm not saying that they're wrong because if it made scripture, clearly he did prophesy this. So maybe that knowledge of his prophecy that was handed down through the oral tradition was written out and this portion is true. You know, so, but we can't take the whole as a true because it would be in the canon if it was to be there. 
All right, so let's take a look at Enoch chapter 1, verse 91. It says this in the, in the writings of Enoch. It says, Behold, he comes with the myriads of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to destroy all the wicked and to convict all flesh for all the wicked deeds that they have done and the proud and the hard works that wicked sinners spoke against him. And you can see that there in verse 14, uh, he actually quotes that, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. And that's what it says there in Enoch as well. So most scholars, you can look it up yourselves, not take my word. And I actually prefer that you would look these things up. Look it up and see that most scholars would agree that Jude is for sure quoting from the Enoch's writings in this particular portion. But once again, I, just because they quoted it doesn't mean that, that what they're saying here for sure happened that a bunch of angels came down and intermingled with humanity. Yeah. Great. Oh, Jude 14 and 15. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, so let, does anybody want to read? You'd like to read? Okay, great. Would you bring the mic over here? This here is the whole context of of the Genesis 6 account from the second temple period writing of Enoch. Once again, I am not teaching that this is truth. This is for fun so that you know what Peter was trying to get across. Does everybody understand that? I am not saying go home and believe that angels were hooking up with humanity. It could have happened. That's Multiple cultures believe that. Uh, but once again, that's not the point of this verse. The point of this verse is God punished them, whether it's these angels or the uh, followers of the enemy. But it's like, why are these angels? So this explains it in uh, the Jewish writing of the time. Uh, all of those. Okay. Enoch 6, 1 through 4. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto two them, oh, excuse me, unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heavens, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Simjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. 7, 1 through 6. And all the others together with them. I skipped some of the portions that aren't prudent to the flood story, so that's why you're bouncing around a little bit. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one. And they began to go into unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots, and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant, and they bare great giants, whose height was three thousand ells, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began Can to I tell you, there's stories throughout multiple cultures. Even in the native cultures, they have giants with six fingers, multiple rows of teeth, red hair, devouring humanity. Multiple cultures throughout the world have the same mythology as what you're reading from the Jewish mythology here. And it is an interesting correlation. And Josephus, in his writings, said that this was a direct correlation with the Titans and the Olympians and, of course, the demigods of the Greek mythology as well. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. Then said the Most High, the, this is 10, 1 through 8. Then said the Most High, the Holy and Great One spake and sent Uriel to the son of Lamech and said to him, Go to Noah and tell him in my name, hide thyself and reveal to him the end that is approaching that the whole Remember earth the name will be Ariel, because that's actually in scripture. And we'll, we'll hit on that one as well. The demon Ariel, at that point, fallen angel. But go ahead. And a deluge is about to come upon the whole earth and will destroy all that is in it. And now instruct him that he may escape and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. And again the Lord said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert which is Judeo, and okay, cast okay, go, there. go back. We're, we're going to hit on that too in Leviticus. It talks about this. Uh, go ahead and read that last portion again there about Azazel. And again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is in Judeo, and cast him therein and place upon him rough and jagged rocks 
and cover him with darkness and let him abide there forever and cover his face that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire and heal the earth, which the angels have corrupted and proclaim the healing of the earth that they may heal the plague and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to have her stop there, but you get the picture. You get the picture that this uh, ancient writing was basically saying that these angels came down, hooked up with humanity, had an evil demonic spawn through humanity, and because of this great sin and the, the sciences that they taught humanity, God punished the earth because of this great rebellion, and that is why the flood came and destroyed humanity. So that's the con concept there okay so it's an interesting thing remember that demon that it casts into the darkness here because we do have a few minutes to be able to talk about that so I want to hit on this for a little bit now is is that true did that happen um, if Jewish mythology is sure could have um, is that what Peter was coming across I will show you that it for sure was because you can actually see within the context of Peter's letters you can see in first Peter Chapter 3, verse 18 through 20, says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but be made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, which was what she was about to read there in uh, the book of Enoch. You can actually see portions of that as well. That He says, that, well, anyways, let me go back. Back to uh, First Peter here. It says, In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. Okay, that's important. Okay, the reason why that is important is, once again, what Peter is trying to get across here is this story of these angels who came and left, like Jude said, left their heavenly dwelling for strange flesh, the flesh of humanity. And because of that, they, uh, you know, sinned greatly. They sinned greatly before God and rebelled against God and rebelled. And because of this, they were cast into darkness in the desert. And that's where that whole thought that Peter, Jude, and the first century believers uh, came across these thoughts. Now, is that true? I think they could have just believed that and it was using it for an illustration and God allowed it to be in Scripture for that illustration's sake. I don't think it gives validity to the story per se, but it's a crazy story, but it could. Why not? They tried to sure rape angels in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, clearly they had the properties to be able to do so. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, where do we go? Then there's, you know, a lot of people will say, well, because of this, I'm not, I'm not going to argue about, you know, whether that's true or not, because that's, who cares? I mean, it's just an interesting story. But what Peter was teaching is that in, uh, you know, that Jesus, when he died, that he went in the first, this uh, first Peter, he went down and proclaimed to the spirits in prison on his death. Let me throw something at you. What do we do when we baptize, according to Romans, according to Colossians? When we, I mean, it says there in Colossians 2, 12, uh, we have been buried with him in baptism, and you will also be raised with him through faith and the powerful work of God, raised him from the dead. You know, and uh, so what do we do in baptism? We identify with his death, and we identify with his resurrection. Now, do you understand a little bit more why we do that? Because according to Peter, Jesus, when he died, he went down and proclaimed to those who were in prison, whether that would be these fallen angels like Enoch did in the Enoch's writings, which is what Peter is probably referring to. See, Enoch went down there and talked to them. They're like, tell Yahweh to let us out. And he's like, no way, you're, you're toast. You've been judged. Have a good day. And then Enoch left. Well, in the same way, Christ went down there and proclaimed you know, uh, the gospel to them as well who perished during the times of Noah. Once again, all within the context of the story of Noah. So once again, when we die, baptism is a powerful spiritual um, uh, um, warfare thing. It's a proclamation, not just to humans. It's a powerful proclamation to all, to all that we identify with his death. 
plus we identify with his resurrection. We are proclaiming God's power over the enemies, which is what Peter is referring to that Jesus did, that Jesus went and proclaimed to his enemies like Enoch did in his story. Jesus went and proclaimed to his enemies victory. So when you are baptized, you're proclaiming to the enemy Christ's death and resurrection, victory over. Isn't that cool? A little side stuff. I mean, it's just fun stuff. You know, I mean, like I said, you know, don't make a weird doctrine out of this stuff, but it is cool. Uh, that, that demon that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was told of the scroll in the book of Enoch. Oh, yeah. That existed. But, um, and he was shown a microfilm in 1990 about it, but they were never able to produce an actual. From the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah. yeah. Well, we have them uh, as far as like ancient ones, but as far as Dead Sea Scrolls, I don't know. Yeah. But it's interesting. But, but once again, this is fun stuff. Don't make weird doctrines out of this stuff. Just enjoy it for the weirdness that it was. All right, so a cool note. I want to freak you out about the scapegoat in the Old Testament. Can I have, we only have two more verses and then we'll close, I promise. Uh, I need someone to read Deuteronomy. Oh, actually, let's do, can we do three verses? Okay, who wants to read three verses, three different people? Well, Matt will be quick on the mic, okay? Would you look up Leviticus 17, verse 7? Anybody else? Deuteronomy chapter 32, Verse 17 through 18. One more. Okay. Uh, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8 through 10. You get the weird one. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun one. It's fun. 17, 7. This is talking about um, kind of what we had talked about earlier, about the uh, different gods and uh, that were just demons and, and stuff like that. So this is the Tree of Life Bible translation. They are no longer to offer their sacrifices to the goat demons, after which they... Is that mic on? Is it green? Okay, Uh, if you can't lick it, it's too far away. (laughs) Pretend it's an ice cream cone. (laughs) Yeah, just don't be sick. (laughs) Uh, Leviticus 17.7. They are no longer to offer their sacrifices to the goat demons, after which they play the prostitute. This will be a statute forever to them throughout their generations. Okay. I can change translation. No, that's fine. That actually got across. That's fine. Uh, who had Deuteronomy uh, 32, verse 17? So, Margo, um, this is actually perfect verse for what we talked about. This will explain it completely. 17, it says, They sacrificed to demons the no gods, gods who were altogether strange to them, Newcomers lately arrived were they, before whom your fathers had never stood in awe. 18. You were unmindful of the rock who begot you, and you forgot the God who gave you being. All right. So that first portion there says, they sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they never knew. So once again, so as a Christian, we don't believe in multiple gods, but we do believe in different uh, beings that were created by God himself. And of course, we call those either angels if they haven't rebelled against God or fallen angels or other words, demons or unclean spirits or pick a term. You know, there's many of them, but uh, basically uh, people worshiped them as though they were gods. So to say that those gods didn't exist, to say Thor and, you know, some of the mythologies of all those ancient things, I think there was a demon that's probably Thor. There was a demon that was probably Yoki, the, you know, of, of, of North mythology. You know, we look at, uh, you know, uh, the different, you know, I think there was a demon of Zeus. I think there was a demon of Pan. I think there was a demon, you know, that are, well, Pan, look, it's a goat demon, literally. I mean, you can't get much more literal than that. All right, so let's go ahead and look at one more, and uh, this is that one that, oh, yeah. That is, that last one was Deuteronomy. 32, verse 17 through 18. And then we're going to close with this verse, and I'll I'll summarize it back up. Yours is Leviticus, chapter 16, verse 8 through 10, please. I, I second the motion. You're fine. Stay in here, girl. Enjoy it. 
We all have kids, and if you don't, that's what they sound like. All right. My boys, man, I can't get them to be quiet, so you're fine. Don't worry about it. All right, go ahead. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8 through 10. He is cast into the lots of two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for the sin offering. But the goat chosen by the lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making anointment by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. All right. Does anybody else have another version? Do they have uh, like an ESV? That's a good version, and, it's, and that's a literal scapegoat. But uh, the Hebrew actually says it a little differently. I don't want to be a goat either. Yeah, Leviticus yeah, Do you have a different, what version do you have? All right. Uh, I, I have the ESV, which is uh, a little on the choppy side. But it's a little bit more of a transliteration, so uh, we might use it if, if somebody else doesn't have uh, a portion here. Okay, uh, yeah, does anybody have, anybody have an ESV? Right here. Matt, would you read this? This is out of the ESV, and this is more of a, a translation instead of just a, the interpretation scapegoat. You can actually look this up. It's in the Hebrew. It's in the original Hebrew. And this is from the ESV, English Standard Version. Uh, and this is a modern translation that's really good. I love the NIV, too, and I use the NIV as is, well. Is there two pages? I use a lot of them. Just that, just that one there, yeah. Oh. Then we got to close. And Aaron, shall, and Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord. Demon and, goat, not just scapegoat. Demon goat. And use read, it that, read that whole portion again. you got to catch this because it ties everything together. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Az Azazel shall be... Wait, wait, pause for a sec. Where was Azazel in Enoch cast to? Cast in the pit? In the where? In the desert. Go ahead. <clears throat> But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. To the desert for Azazel. So uh, wilderness, desert, it's uh, interchangeable. So once again, are the Israelites sacrificing this goat to this goat demon? No, no, no. What they're doing is symbolic. They were placing their sins on this scapegoat and saying, why don't you go back to the one that's in prison for sin, and you take your garbage with you and get out of here. They weren't sacrificing it as though he was allotted something, this, this goat demon, but he was, he was given back to them what they gave, their sin. He was given back to them their sin. Does that make sense? So, once again, all oh, this is weird. Let's summarize it, and then we got to close. I already went for an hour. All right, so... Summarizing this once again, the point of this is whether these are the angels that followed Satan or these angels who are the Genesis 6 account angels, uh, either way, they were punished because of their sin. And Peter is trying to get across these false teachers are going to be punished. There is a final reckoning. All right. Make sense. All right. Let's go out some prayer. Father, you're awesome. Lord, we thank you that we can have fun and dive into some of these crazy things. And Lord, I just pray that once again, we would not lose point of why Peter wrote this in your word. And that is as a warning that we would stay true to you. We would stay true to the gospel and what was preached to us. And Lord, that we would just continue to follow you and bless everybody and keep us safe in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful evening. And if you have any questions, I, I, I like talking. <laughs>